As I stated earlier, my name is Virginia Rondetta Hernandez. I'm currently the chair of the Department of Social Work Education at California State University, Fresno, which we call uh, Fresno State uh, out here in the Central Valley. I'm here with Dr. Richard Salzgeber, who is uh, a maritime faculty from our department and who has been uh, nominated and has been accepted into the California Hall of Distinction for Social Work. So, we're going to get started with this interview. Um, the purpose of this interview is, of course, to have some background uh, about Dr. Salzgiver and to basically have an, a memory um, of his story uh, in social work and to, for this to be included in the oral history collection of the California Social Work Archives. Um, so, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Richard Salzgeber. Dr. Salzgeber, I'm just turn to you now. Um, how did you become a social worker? Well, it was not your typical path. I started off and wanted to be a teacher, and uh, I completed my, my doctorate at Carnegie Mellon in uh, social and intellectual history of the United States, where I studied early uh, the treatment of early, the early treatment of juvenile delinquents in the United States, and particularly in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And through that, I actually got a job working as a teacher of juvenile adjudicated juvenile delinquents. And in that position as a teacher, it was a it was a wonderful model. It was a milieu model. Uh, based on the idea that uh, people, uh, juvenile delinquents, needed to learn decision making in their life. I encountered social workers um, and I thought this is a curious group of people. I liked them and uh, I liked what they talked about. I liked their eclectic approach to working with kids. Um, and then I, I quit that job to finish my, my doctorate and volunteered in a psychiatric hospital for kids. Okay. And again, uh, associated with uh, social workers. Um, and down the road they offered me a position of career awareness specialist. And in that, through that position, encouraged me to go back and get my MSW, which I did at the University of Pittsburgh. So it sounds like social workers really were the ones that influenced you to enter the field. It was really the peer model and it was consulting with them and sitting around talking with them um, that really uh, made me think, well maybe I need to move from the teaching realm and into this, this realm. Um, and um, there were a lot of things that, that were going on that I didn't really even in my consciousness or aware of because was, I've been a person with a disability all my life and I've had a tumultuous childhood mm -hmm. um, and was institutionalized for six years where I suffered all kinds of abuse mm -hmm. and carried with that an anger that had no positive outlet and I think probably upon encountering this group of individuals that looked at all kinds of things going on with these kids, um, I thought, hmm, there may be an approach that I could facilitate some things. So it was kind of a, it was not a natural fit. Uh, wished I had known about social work early in, in this pathway, but it was good enough to, to get into the, to the realm. So as you were going through this, um, I guess, like assessment about, hmm, do I want to be a social worker? You know, these folks are great. This might be something that I could do and certainly serve youth better. Um, tell me a little bit about the political, social, and economic climate at that time. Well, this was the middle 70s, and, and the uh, 
the influence of the 60s were still there. So we were, we, we were still talking about um, people that were disenfranchised gaining power and this, you know, there were, there were vestiges of the war on poverty and all that stuff. And with, with the kids that I worked with, um, both juvenile delinquent and later uh, severely emotionally disabled uh, kids, um, there were still strong emphasis on um, the process of, 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 of integrating these folks into the aggregate society. I remember the young psychiatrist that, that ran this uh, psychiatric facility that I was a part of, he was, he was a rebel. Um, he, in, in this little, this little uh, private hospital, created a milieu approach. So everybody went to staffing. The janitors went to staffing. The social workers, the teachers, the teachers' aide, everybody was aware of each of those children and, and could impact their treatment plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was, that was revolutionary yeah. in those days. And mm -hmm. is very revolutionary in, in given the, the, the emphasis now. But, mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was involved and uh, everybody knew about the kid in terms of what was needed and what their issues were. What was the outside climate like? And I know that you created a milieu and a way of working together, but what was what were the social times like? Well, the social times were it, what they were happening. They, they were moving to a more conservative realm after the sixties, mm -hmm. and 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 people resisted that. Mm -hmm. So there were like these little streams of uh, of change and reform, but at least from my perspective. The conservative realm was was imposing its 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 issue, so there was less and less talk of what used to be talked about in the '60s mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of and and more conservative folks were being elected in the aggregate. And this was the area era in which you began your social work education. This was the era I went back, um, and and it was actually the end of the '70s. In the beginning of the '80s, so so that that the, the entrenchment of the new conservatism, the, the the Ronald Reagan model was uh, uh, coming to be. I remember I had a at the University of Pittsburgh uh, a very radical social work professor, uh, Kiernan Stenson, uh, who was fantastic. But uh, he used to kid about he he called them Ronald Reagans. He was, he was, uh, he would, he'd get, oh, he was just so angry mm -hmm. about Ronald Reagan's. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you finished your Finished my, degree? my master's degree. Okay. I, I went back. University yeah. of Pittsburgh. And, and moved to California. Mm -hmm. And my whole emphasis, my whole, my whole desire was because my whole background was basically psych, psychiatric and working in a psychiatric hospital for kids, mm -hmm. I, that's what I was going to come to California and do. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dream was always to provide that kind of perspective to, um, to people that didn't have a lot of money. So how did your career unfold? Well, you but then, then uh, I came to California, moved to San Francisco, and the jobs that were available were in case management in developmental disability. And I had been a person with a disability all my life, but in Pennsylvania, um, the, the mode was I did things in spite of my disability, and the people, the persona was I was not really a disabled person, mm -hmm. because I did everything. I lived in a house that had two sets of steps up. I mean, I took kids uh, on field trips. I, you know, I, I, I used crutches in those days, now I use a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, so. They negated my disability, and so did I. So I come to, I remember, I got my first job in California was, was a social work worker at Golden Gate Regional Center. Oh, we have something in common. I worked the regional centers also. Oh, really? North Bay. Yeah. Okay, and yeah, you know, uh, yeah, so, yes, very close. <laughs> and I remember my first day on the job, and they had a, a program where they really wanted to represent the diversity of San Francisco. So they had, along with the, the uh, 
various factions and and ethnic commodities that make up San Francisco, they had they hired people with disabilities too as part of their policy. Right. And uh, so I I came in and uh, I met this woman that uh, was a person with a disability. She had myasthenias my, my, myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. My gosh. Um, Abby was her name, and uh, I introduced and we, I introduced myself and we started talking. And I referred to myself as a handicapped person. Mm -hmm. And she jumped all over me. She said, no, you're not a handicapped person. I said, I said you're a person with a disability. I said, well, what's the difference, you know? And so through her, uh, a graduate of USC, by the way, um, in social work with a master's degree, through her, I was introduced to this new realm, disability advocacy, disability politics. So that became your primary focus of practice? Very quickly. Mm -hmm. And Abby was a very great influence on me. And she introduced me to all the players. Some of them social workers, some of them not. Mm -hmm. um, June Kales was one of the players. She's a social worker. And these were community-based social workers? These were people that were in the disabled community working in terms of uh, the civil rights. And their approach was that disability was not dysfunctional. Their purpose was disability was different, just like F, uh, folks from various different world majority diversity. Well, those are the values that drove the um, Center for Independent Living. Exactly. That was, that was the, the center of it. Independent Living Movement was what I was a part of. So I got to play with some of the players at Roberts and, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, it's been a while, um, but some of the key players in the San Francisco Bay Area mm -hmm. and got to know them and work with them. People in Oakland, Berkeley. Right. Mm -hmm. And then tied into people in Southern California, Brenda Primo um, and June Kales. June Kales was uh, living in Los Angeles. So, so in your primary focus of work with disabilities, what other, what other um, positions did you hold? Well, then um, I left Golden Gate Regional Center uh, and went to the Center for Independent Living in Belmont. Mm -hmm. And there moved uh, from direct practice into administration. Oh. And I got an administrative position there. And, and all and within the independent living movement, all administrative positions are really quasi-political positions. Mm -hmm. And from that, I involved myself with uh, state-run um, organizations around disability. So you took your concerns around care uh, of persons with disabilities and advocacy around that to a higher level? Well, to, to the political realm, which is... And, and I, I, I function out of the adage, everything is political. Mm. Every, and human service the provision is political. So it's talk, all. To, talk to me about that. I know that you have talked that way with students in the classroom at Fresno State, but what does that framework mean? Well, one of the glories about our profession, Virginia, and you know this, is that there is no separation between individual treatment and the political process. They're tied together. Correct. And this gives you an opportunity to, to to, uh, to, to, to play that out. Mm -hmm. And so that if you're, if you're a uh, person doing individual treatment, generally, and some of our colleagues, uh, Ann Petrovich represents us, uh, some of our retired, rural represents us, you, you not only you know, uh, work with individuals, you work in the aggregate system. Yourself, you're, you're an example of that. You, you've done both, and, and even in the realm of both, you play out that political piece because everything is political. Uh, so what would you consider some of your major achievements uh, in that realm of administration? Well, I was executive director for the Center of Independent Living, uh, the CAF Independent Living Center in Fresno. Mm -hmm. I, was, I moved from Belmont there. I, was, uh, I went from contract manager to deputy director and then was offered a position in Fresno as the director of uh, CAF Independent Living Center. And so in that position, I have, I, we did lots of things. I worked with uh, um, Tony Coelho in terms of getting ADA passed. Yeah. I did the grassroots thing. He would uh, rely on me to give, to give and to get information 
uh, about ADA and that process going on. Uh, um, so um, I, I was a piece of his information in the process. Um, so would you say that when you went into social work you had a specific career goal? Initially, yeah, but it totally changed when I came to California. It shifted yeah, because I, you know, I, I wanted to give individual treatment. I, that's and uh, because that was my background, and and I worked with in that hospital. I worked with some fantastic social workers. Um, there was a woman, Marilyn Hayes, who is uh, is very much educated in psychoanalytic background. She was a fan. When in my specialty and my love was group therapy and I, were, I was a member of the yeah. Western Pennsylvania Group Therapy Society and uh, actually held an office in that um, and uh, I, there, there's two things that I, well there's three things but I won't mention the one but uh, there's three loves, music and, and running group therapy, I mean running groups are, is a, it's just an exciting process because you're doing but that was where I was going and then suddenly when I came to California and I think part of that was my own unresolved issues about disability that came to the surface and this, this kind of a synthesis with my career and with some issues that I, I really need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and again, once, yeah, I, 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 in that process, went to see uh, an individual one-on-one -on -one and uh, who became one of my colleagues and now is a good friend of mine. So what you're saying is that um, you recognize that some of the, the, some of what drove you was trying to maybe resolve some of the injustices you may have felt as a person with a disability? Well, it's more than that. My, some of the things that I experience, I can translate to the broad spectrum of the people I work with. Okay. Uh, and, the, and working with juvenile delinquents, um, you would think, okay, I use crutches in. Some of these kids were in there for murder. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the kids were in there for stealing candles out of a Catholic church. Some of the kids were, I had one kid that was, uh, he was adept at stealing uh, Port Authority buses. Uh, he had a down pat. He buses, would, huh? Yeah, well, when the driver would come to eat lunch at Arby's or somewhere, he would hide in the bushes, and when the driver would walk in, he'd take the bus and take wow. it for a joy. Named Fred, but I'll never. And some of these, and it's amazing you can remember these kids. Yeah. Um, but what, when they saw me with my crutches, somehow we connected. Somehow, and, and we, they said, okay, this guy has experienced some stuff. I've experienced some stuff. Maybe he has something to say to me. Yeah. Um, but that's been, that's been a piece of my practice all along. So being someone who's maybe different physically, but is actually has something much common, much in common with others. The experience, and and See? and when I when I taught courses on oppression, that was my main thesis. Mm -hmm. That when you experience oppression, when you experience that phenomena, you have a unity. You have um, mm -hmm. you have a unity of experience. Uh, mm -hmm. well, and. If I don't know what you're going to leave in this or not, but our mutual friend and colleague Ben Cuellar, I remember. Um, ben was the dean of uh, of our uh, school, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I worked together, and we did some political battles together. Um, in one of those meetings, I said I turned to him. How can you do this, man? They're beating you up. And he says, he turns to me, he says, Saul's giver, he says, uh, I started in the fields. Mm -hmm. You know, I worked 14 hours a day. He said, what are they going to take away from me? And when he said that, I hearkened back to the six years that I spent institutionalized. And that kind of imprisonment that nobody really understands until they've been imprisoned. Um, that total powerlessness. Mm. That somehow in your psychic you have to muster up the power to go on. Mm -hmm. He and I shared that. 
him from a Latino perspective and me from a disability perspective. And, and so that was the thing that united us mm -hmm. in trying to bring change mm -hmm. and to empower people. Mm -hmm. But kids saw that. Um, you know, my students, students I think saw that. Yes. Um, that I wasn't just talking something from out of a book, right. that I experienced their struggle. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, uh, not only from the struggle of disability, but of education. I was the first person in my family to be educated. My relatives were ridge runners, and I would talk to many students from a variety of, of ethnic groups that they were the first child. Mm -hmm. And so we had that connection um, and the struggles that go on. So. What's a ridge runner? A ridge runner is a person that lives in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh -huh. um, the Blue Ridge Mountains run from New York all the way down, I think, into the Carolinas. And they're basically hillbillies. Oh, okay. That's and, the word uh, that we use. Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so, and but um, all my relatives lived way back in the hills. But what you're saying is that um, they were different and distinct from mainstream. They were, you know, right. It's like and, to be on marginalized or on the outside. And education was not a part of their framework. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in your career, um, um, you eventually got to teaching. So tell me a little bit about that piece. It's no different. <laughs> I, How did you get into teaching? Well, I got into teaching again through our mutual friend oh, okay. who invited me to teach part-time and also Irv, my, our, another mutual friend, and, and made, uh, first initiated that thought in my mind, said, hey, you make a fantastic teacher. And uh, when Ben became chair of the department, he saw me, I guess, on the pool list and called me in. Uh -huh. And um, he was the one. And then um, we worked together on some projects, including NASW stuff. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to then go for a tenure track position. Oh, okay. So, again, yeah. a person that can see diversity in a broad perspective. Well, and also the gifts that it brings, yeah. because it does bring another a, a way of life forward to others that students may not have had the opportunity to think about. Yeah. So when you think about um, your yeah. career as a practitioner and you think about your career as an educator, what would you consider to be some of your biggest successes? Well, I, I've, I've had a lot of good times, a lot of fun, and in terms of education, I think one of my biggest successes has been the change in the Department of Social Work Education. Can you elaborate on that? I, you know, uh, again, initially through uh, Ben's leadership. We managed to shift the department from um, a focused perspective to a broad perspective that included not only direct treatment models, case management models, macro practice, political process. The other thing that Ben initiated was to bring more women into the department, and I. I facilitated that along with cadre of a couple of people. Um, we felt that the department needed to reflect again the people that we were serving. Mm -hmm. So probably in terms of education, one of my biggest successes is to watch our department grow in that perspective. And you're a representation of that. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> so what you're talking about though is diversifying the. Department. Diversifying the and broadening it and making it truly into um, a department that serves where we live. And also to, like you say, the broader lens, the what we now call the multi-systems uh, perspective that we utilize, that the, that the curriculum's anchored in. You actually helped to define that, didn't you? Yeah, we, we all did. It was a team effort. But that, 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 I think that was a pretty significant achievement, very important. I mean, and also my writing and um, the textbook that I co-wrote were, 
with my writing partner, Ramel McElprang. Mm -hmm. And also some of the changes that we try to initiate in, in our profession. Mm -hmm. Because our profession still is struggling with looking at disability as part of diversity. Mm -hmm. It's it still, our profession tends to still see disability as something to be treated rather than something to be incorporated politically. Okay. And so Ramel and I have worked for years and years. Our book reflects that mm -hmm. um, perspective, uh, that disability is really an issue of diversity. Mm -hmm. It's not really an issue of dysfunction. Right. So. Right. And some of the changes we made in CSWE and NESW, NESW is much more responsive to disability as a diversity perspective. So, and you've had a hand in that. Yeah. In that shift. Involved within both arenas. So when you think about, again, practice education, what have been some of the obstacles that you've encountered? In terms of uh, the education process? You can focus on that, yeah. I think people's inability to make that shift. Mm -hmm. Some people get it and some people don't. For example? Um, Romel and I used to do um, uh, 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 workshops at the Council of Social Work Education. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about, you know, practice with disability from a diversity perspective. Mm -hmm. And social workers in, in the audience had trouble with that. And at one point, I remember <laughs> one Saturday morning, uh, a woman practitioner stood up and basically accused me of compensating for my disability through my work of what I was doing politically and academically. So there is still within social work this idea that folks with disabilities need to be treated and that medical model approach mm -hmm. to that. What would it take to change that thinking? Well, I think it's changing now. And as you look at the new practitioners, and you look at educational models, and you look at some of the things at CSWE, there's a big difference. This was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think there's a big difference now. But I'm thinking that there's been disappointment along the way, too, in terms of people not getting it. Yeah, there has been some. How'd there's, you deal with that? You move on. You win some, and you lose some. My, I used to work, the, the woman I used to work for in the Chancellor's office, Maria Santos, she used to say, declare victory and move on. And I like that. <laughs> we go into battle. There were many battles we'd have, but sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But you don't, you don't put forth a personification of losing. You say, you declare victory and move on. And those were great words. It's kind of like I made my point. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's move or, forward. you know, you win some and you lose some. But you never say, I lose. You never say, go. You know? uh -huh. and, right. uh, I like that. Declare victory and move on. That's right. You wouldn't like Maria. She was cool. So if you had to say, um, what has been your most satisfying experience as a social worker and or social work educator? My, I have many of them, and they usually revolve around, at this point, students. I, and I can think of individual students. I think I can think of individual students that have gone on who, again, were first-generation students who now have their PhDs and are teaching at the university. Women students, uh, Latin, Latina students. Mm -hmm. um, I can think back of, I had, I remember one class I taught, taught in oppression, and uh, there were two very fundamentalist ministers in that class. And, and, the, and the section on the LGBTQ folks, I would present some th and they would literally turn red. And I wouldn't let it go. Mm -hmm. And I, my approach in dealing with that issue with them was I didn't, you know, tell them what they believed is wrong. My approach was, how do you hold these values in relationship to your practice? You know, it's your problem. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to tell you to change your thinking. Mm -hmm. 
but you have to understand that social work values says basically that everybody is legitimate and that you have not the right to impose your values. It's not about you, it's about the person that you're working with. I think one of my greatest accomplishments when one of those individuals came upon getting their MSW and they're still practicing in the valley and they're fantastic social workers, mm -hmm. he, came, he comes up to me and he says, you know Saul's giver, he says, you've changed my whole perspective on this issue. And uh, I think, I, think I, I like that. Um, I like, uh, but it's not been great triumphs. At one point I was trying to put together a disability institute on campus and we didn't do that. The, the, the triumphs that I look back on I feel really good about mm -hmm. are the students. Are the students. And the students. And knowing that what I taught them and the representation of my own life will be carried on. And some of them are going to be teachers and, and, and I still, I don't know what does that link of PDR or whatever thing is. With that. With that. And I mean, I, I must get a hundred students want to link up with me. Um, I think the students and their accomplishments uh, and then my, my, that I look back and say, wow, this yeah. is really neat. This was worthwhile. This was cool doing. Yeah. It was fun. So, but if you had to say, you know, what was a difficult experience in your career, what might it have been? I think those, those were times in that battle of facilitating change within the university around either about disability issues mm -hmm. where you would just up and lose and lose bad and you would be disenfranchised. From the, the aggregate, really? and I'm, I'm and I'm not going to get specific because there's still some of these players are around. Mm -hmm. But you know, you get you get beat up and um, you've lost that round. And 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 the hardest part is is getting the 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 impetus to go back in there <laughs> and fight again. Uh, and, and you go back and you lick your wounds and, and you do that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been several of those entities from the president of the university on down to various deans. Um, and, uh, Would you attribute that to prejudice? Well, that's, again, the whole concept of the isms are three-dimensional phenomena. Mm -hmm. And many of us, and we all do in our society, you and I both, we carry these things with us and some of them are so hidden. So probably yes, mm -hmm. but people don't recognize that in themselves. Well, maybe it's not the word biases. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, that's they're absolutely they're across the board. And I mean, I could give you story after story, but I'm not because no, <laughs> there's very... players in here that still are playing. But I think you know, it's safe to say, and I may be wrong that people do carry um, biases that are informed by fundamental values that they hold or that they've acquired. Uh, and that in many instances, unless someone's been, had a first-hand experience with someone different than themselves, it's very difficult for them to accept that differentness is equal. That was always the story. The legislators, both Republican and Democrat that I worked with when I was uh, working in the aggregate with the state, it was always easier to work with folks that had somewhere in their background a disabled individual. Yes. And it was always, because they, they at least got a piece of it. Um, so when you think about the social, political, and economic climate that where you started your career, and you think about it today in present terms, what do you see as being different? Well, what's different now is there's a whole lot more people that represent these groups in leadership positions than there were when I started. Hmm. But yet, there's also a, a conservative phenomena happening of, of the, the medicalization of our profession and the push 
for the corporatization of it. And so there are these things going on like this. When I started, there was a great hope. You know, the 60s, I was a child of the 60s. There was a great hope we were going to change the world. And I started off by thinking I could sing a couple songs with my guitar and this was going to make a difference. And here we are now, the world hasn't changed much, it's more corporate. But yet, when I was talking about those issues of diversity, even back east where I am now, which is a heck of a lot different than California, we were talking about that, where it's a lot easier to be different. Uh, social workers, physicians, everybody has much broader awareness of difference. And so they incorporate in practice. So ethnic components of medical practice are more prominent now than they were before. Disability um, autonomy is much more prominent. When I talk to a physician, I don't have to fight them about issues anymore. Um, so it's a mixed bag, Virginia. It's, it's a mixed bag. I mean, here you had this, this, this passion. You don't, the passion is much different now. It's within a, a much more corporate as you know, uh, perspective. Right. But it's still there, it just manifests a little differently. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and so so uh, declare victory and move on? Well, you, that's what you do, that's how you survive. <laughs> so what do you think are the issues that social work should be addressing today? Social work is going to have to deal with this, uh, the reality of what it brings, its eclectic nature, the beauty of its foundation, uh, I always say I love this profession because it was founded by women. And in my perspective, women tend to have a more eclectic perspective of the world. Social work has to find a way of surviving in this, in quotes, professional perspective and keep that, that core eclectic sociological, psychological background. Mm -hmm. uh, because the emphasis is pharmacological. Uh, pharma Pharmacologic. Thank you. That. And uh, to make it quick and dirty in a medical sense. And, but social work is about interaction. Social work is understanding where people come from. Social work is that thing. And third party payers don't want to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the struggle to frame that in a way that uh, can get paid for, but yet still be there. And the key, I think, that again is the education process educational process and schools of education, social work education are extremely important. Who's playing in them, who's teaching in them, how they teach in them. Uh, I used to have this concept of guerrilla social work. Mm, I like and, that. Yeah, and I, even at our, that, that, what was that 50th thing that we did where you, I started off having a half an hour talking. Oh, the legacy dinner? Five, yes. five minutes. And, oh, yeah. Anyway, one of my former students came up to me and she said, well, I, I just have to tell you what happened today with my supervisor. She said uh, her supervisor wanted to do something in relation to this client, and she stood her ground and said, no. Mm -hmm. and, and finally she said in frustration, and these were the things that we talked about in class. She said, I'm not a technician, I'm a guerrilla social worker. And I thought, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, and but you have to frame your stuff in, in in what's going on now, but you still have to hold those values mm -hmm. as well. Values of, of believing in this eclectic approach, believing that life is three dimensional, believing that your client is the most valuable source of the information. Your client is the center of what's going on. It's not about you. It's really about your client. How can I use these skills that I have to facilitate that person into becoming what they want to become? Mm -hmm. And that's tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the agencies that I work with, and I used to do that all the time, you don't get rewarded for that. You got to be careful, you got to be smart. Right. Um, I remember organizing parents of kids with psychiatric disabilities. And the administration of the, uh, of, the, of the facility really getting mad. They didn't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I remember at uh, the regional center taking special time not to advocate for the client, but teaching the parents how to advocate 
for the kid. Mm -hmm. And my supervisor wasn't happy with the time that I was taking uh, doing that. But, you know. You, but that was a version of guerrilla warfare. That's guerrilla yeah. social guerrilla work. Social. work, work. Yeah. Guerrilla social work. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. But you have to do that. And so that's, I think that's the challenge now. And I think, I think the burden is on social work education. Mm -hmm. um, so then what should we be doing? Well, first of all, you should be teaching people about that environment. Okay. And second of all, you should keep in mind the history of our profession and where it came from. Mm -hmm. Always remember we started on the streets. Always remember, I went this afternoon to look at uh, Jane Addams, that mm -hmm. statue. Mm -hmm. and, and what a wonderful model that was. Mm -hmm. Always remember, that's where we started. Mm -hmm. We started on the streets. And it was... It was a give and take process where, yeah, she gave something and her people gave something, but they also got something back. So they learn different cooking styles and they learn how to sew differently and do different dancing. And they taught, well, how, here's how you navigate this system in order to survive. Mm -hmm. It was a sharing, it was an interaction. They learned together. They learned together. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the essence of our profession. We got to remember it. But again, doing that now within the corporate structure, yeah. uh, that's a trick. It, it, it's a challenge for sure. But there's a bunch of people out there doing it. And mm -hmm. one of your burdens when you find new faculty is to find people that have done it mm -hmm. and know how to do it, but yet hold those values. Mm -hmm. That's the trick. Right. Being guided by the values that, of the profession yeah. and being informed that you know, we're all in it together. We're all in together, and it's not, it's not going to be a pleasant trip all the time. Right. And you've got to be smart about it, and you've got to declare victory and move on. So if you had to do it all over again, would you have done your career differently? Not really. I've learned so much. And starting, and even my degree in social and intellectual history of the United States has brought me things to the social work profession. Not, in, in, not just within policy, which you might think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I, because I also have a degree, and I also looked at uh, African American history. Mm -hmm. So my knowledge of social and intellectual history along with African American history has, has enlightened me in terms of things that sometimes even social workers miss, mm -hmm. in terms of family structure and issues like that. Mm -hmm. So no, I wouldn't have. And the way I came about it, I got to know social work from an experiential perspective. I got to know social workers by hanging with social workers and eating lunch with them. And, and that's where I learned about it. That's where I said, okay, hmm, this sounds really good. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't change any of that. And one of the things that I was happy about my years of practice, not only at the micro level, but the macro level. Because when I walk into that classroom, I was bringing stuff that actually really happened. Right, your practice experience. And I brought my practice experience along with my knowledge of theory and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So I could bring theory alive to these, these students and say, this is the way it is. This is what you're going to face. This is what you're going to be dealing with. Um, and it ain't going to be easy, and you're not going to do it for the money because it ain't that much money. You're going to do it for the joy of watching people grow. So what might be learned from your experiences when you think about um, people wanting to enter the profession or actually working in the profession of social work today? I don't know. It's, it's a real... If, if, if you're really passionate about people becoming, if you've, if you've ever experienced imprisonment, if you ever experienced powerlessness, it's an exciting way to translate that and watch other people grow. And when they grow, a little piece of, piece of you grows. So I would recruit students that have that passion. That's what I do, <laughs> and that's what we've done, mm -hmm. and that's what. And many times we have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of them. Well, especially in this valley. Yeah. Yeah. In this valley, it's. Uh, but you know, I the the mission that one can have in this valley is so exciting. Um, you know, there are people in, um, who 
who might be viewing this video really don't know the context of Central California, um, nor, well, you know, its potency to be able to do good social work. And, and, and that was a piece that I brought to the, you know, there, there are many Latino folks in a variety, there's like, what, it was 110 different cultures over there, yes. Central mm -hmm. Valley? Yeah, and, and, groups. And, and many of them don't have knowledge about disability. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing. Um, one of our mutual students, uh, you talk about achievements, uh, Edgar, uh, yes. who, who's not with us anymore. Uh, he, that was, he was exciting to work with because he was Latino, mm -hmm. he was a person with a disability, and he also had knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that was a census that, that, that needs to be maintained because right. many people that are disenfranchised don't know what's out there, don't know the resources, or have even cultural issues about disability that they, they have to grope with, they have to come to grips with. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one piece that I provided, and hopefully that can continue with other people mm -hmm. along with that. Yeah. So um, are there any other comments you'd like to share in closing? No. I, uh, again, um, the woman that's kind of workers, Katie, I guess that's her name, mm -hmm. she said, uh, and, and I told this same to you, I said, I, I really don't deserve this award. All I'm doing is my job. Uh, and I, and I, I think that that needs to be clarified. I feel, and this is, this, is, this is true, I'm very fortunate that I got to have a gig where I can watch people grow because it's, it's very selfish. Mm -hmm. Because when I watch people grow, when I watch somebody that has been a loser, from my kids, my juvenile delinquents, and I, who I work from my kids that had severe psychiatric disabilities, to my students in the Central Valley. There is a payoff that you get that, you know, and so I, I just do my job, and I get paid, the, you know, it's, that's really little to do with the money. Mm -hmm. I get paid when when somebody goes on and teaches at the PhD level that was once my student, mm -hmm. or somebody becomes a director of a program uh, that was my student, or somebody who used their project to as a springboard to create an agency right. that now provides service. I mean, what more could you want? Right. I mean, what more could you get? So, you know, to be a to have an award for this? This is your job. You get you you've got paid already, you know. So you got paid already with the how would you say the um, transformation? Yeah, that, I mean who otherwise might hadn't necessarily seen their own potential. Right. And who who everybody said you're a loser. Everybody said, you can't do this, you're not going to go to school, you're not going to be this, you can't do that. Uh, and a story after story of Latino women that were told by their guidance counselors, you're never going to go to school, who are graduating with their masters and someone going on a PhD. And when you were a kid, that's what they said to you. Yep, sure was. That's what they said to you, and, and, and you proved them wrong, didn't you? I sure did. <laughs> So did you. You proved it wrong. Well, I only provided them this little bit of peace that allowed them to do it for themselves. Because yeah. it's all barely, I didn't do anything. Um, but you, you get a lot of satisfaction. Well, as your mentee, I must say it's been an honor uh, to interview you. I'm very excited that you're going to be inducted. I feel really good and I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Virginia. Uh,